Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Turn Century Fiction. We're looking at James Joss's short story uh, Araby from the collection Dubliners. So we just carry on from where we ended last time and we see how speciality and identity uh, sort of then form each other in the story. So when the identity is that of a romantic uh, knight and this is the identity that boy wants to appropriate in the story and everything around him is inimical to that identity. So the identity is a process of appropriation and uh, the space gives a very big dimension to this identity in the sense that when he gets to certain spaces then he begins to achieve that identity in a way which is more comforting. And also we had seen how uh, the adult world uh, is inimical to this identity, this imaginative identity of the knight in shining armor, the knight in the quest for uh, a romantic quest for you know getting something for the beloved. Right, and that uh, adult world is inimical to it, and the whole idea is to conquer the adult world, uh, conquer the adults, uh, you know, vanquish them, and then achieve that identity through a process of romantic affiliation and romantic imagination. Now, we've also seen how the visual narrative, the visual grammar in the story is very, very cinematic in the sense that uh, the way the boy looks at Mangan's sister. Uh, it's very, very cinematic in quality. It's got a camera gaze about it, which is very metonymic. And by metonymic, obviously, I mean uh, it works in fragments. So certain uh, fragments are focalized, certain fragments are focused on, and certain fra fragments are magnified, right? So magnification, close ups, all these become very important in this particular short story. Now, we just carry on from where we ended last time. So this is a setting, the situation is the boy is getting more and more impatient. Uh, because he wants uncle to come back and give him the money to go to the bazaar Araby. And we have seen how Araby becomes a utopian space for the boy in the sense that, you know, that's a bazaar which supposedly contains all the uh, lovely exotic erotic things uh, which he will have access to and he'll bring something for the, go for the girl, Mangan's sister. And that promise that he had made to Mangan's sister, it was a very profound promise in his imagination. And it had the same degree of profundity as a promise made by a knight to his beloved, to his lady love. So that becomes a very important thing over here. Okay, so and then we see what happens when he comes down from the upper part of the house because remember he had gone to the upper part of the house to gain access and to be himself and also look at Mangan's sister. But when he comes downstairs, um, the downstairs is full of adults uh, who are like I said inimical to any idea of romance. And this is what is described uh, by the boy and this should be on your screen. When I came downstairs again, I found Mrs. Mirza sitting at the fire. She was an old garrulous woman, uh, a pawnbroker's widow, who collected used stamps for some pious purpose. So again, look at the very interesting and complex conflation of uh, pious religious signifiers and material markers. So stamps which are used for commercial purposes, stamps which are used for all kinds of business purposes, they are collected over here for some pious purpose. So there is a degree of sarcasm in that sentence. Uh, it is some pious purpose, we don't quite know, it's kept deliberately vague. And we can connect it to uh, the very opening of the story where we have been told that the, uh, the, uh, the priest, the church priest who had died had left all his money uh, to charitable institutions and the furniture to his sister. So the fact that he had a lot of money it has been suggested by all his money. And over here too we have uh, someone who's a pawnbroker's widow, uh, so very much someone uh, very much embedded in the market, embedded in the profit making enterprise, ruthlessly profit making enterprise. And you know she supposedly uh, collects some stamps for some pious purpose. I had to endure the gossip of the tea table. Mrs. Mercer, sorry, the meal was prolonged for beyond an hour and still my uncle did not come. Mrs. Mercer stood up to go. She was sorry she could not wait any longer. But it was after 8 o'clock and the night air, uh, and she did not like to be out late as the night air was bad for her. When she had gone, I began to walk up and down the room, clenching my fists. So again, this is a marker of impatience, a marker of anxiety, a marker of apprehension. So he's waiting for the uncle to come back and Mrs. Mercer, who had been a visitor and who had been talking, uh, you know, there's a lot of gossip you know, spewed out by her while having tea with uh, the, the aunt of the boy. And at some point, eight o'clock, she got up to go because she said that night there was bad for her. 
So again, uh, these are people who prefer to be claustrophobic, who prefer to be indoors, who prefer not to go out in night air. And again, if you look at the way in which these spatial differences are mapped out, uh, a boy, the boy over here, he's dying to go out, he's dying to get out and go to Arabic, dying to get out of the house, essentially. Whereas Mrs. Mirza is someone who, who sort of tries to avoid any interaction or any, any exposure to the night air. So the adult world, the adult proclivities and a childlike world and a childlike proclivities are very clearly mapped out differently, okay, so as ma ma sort of measures of difference. So my aunt said, I'm afraid you may put off your bazaar for this night of our Lord. So, you know, again, the whole idea of using our Lord, the bazaar for our Lord, uh, you know, which the term is described, uh, used to describe something that's essentially a mercantile space, Arabic. So again, look at the way in which uh, we have seen before how the very erotic experience of the boy, the fact that he was getting more and more sexually attracted to the girl, uh, how that was conveyed to us, or to himself as well, through a very confused religious rhetoric, because the whole acknowledgement of sexuality is something which is forbidden to him, right? And so the forbiddenness, and this is obviously part of the uh, Catholic upbringing that he has had, the very decadent control of Catholic Church, which had had its influences, massive influences in Irish imagination at that point of time. So that is something which causes the confusion, that is something which uh, causes them to use religious rhetoric while actually talking about very, very emotional and erotic experiences. So again, similarly we have Mrs. Mercer who collects stamps for some pious purpose and we have the boy's aunt telling, uh, talking about the Arabic, the bazaar, as some, uh, you know, the bazaar of our Lord. At 9 o'clock I heard my uncle's latchkey in the hall though. I heard him talking to himself and heard this whole stand rocking when it had received the weight of his overcoat. I could interpret these signs. When he was midway through his dinner, I asked him to give me the money to go to the bazaar. He had forgotten. So again, you know, if, you, if you take a look at the way in which the significance of the bazaar is so paramount in the boy's imagination and it is so trivial in the uncle's imagination, the demarcation between the adult proclivities and the childlike proclivities are very clearly mapped out. He had clearly forgotten the boy the bazaar, which is to say that you know the bazaar which had which had had such supreme significance in the boy's imagination has very little significance for the uncle. Uh, he just simply forgotten about the bazaar at all. The people are in bed and after the first sleep now, he said, I did not smile. My aunt said to him energetically, can't you give him the money and let him go? You've kept him late enough as it is. So the aunt comes to the rescue away here and goads the uncle to pay him, uh, pay the boy some money just so he can go to the bazaar. My uncle said that he was sorry he had forgotten. He said he believed in an old saying, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. He asked me whether, where I was going and when I told him a second time, he asked me did I know the Arab's fable to his steed. So the Arab's fable to his steed or the horse is a sentimental poem written uh, around that time. Uh, so again, look at the way in which the adult world trivializes the romantic quest that the boy had set up. Uh, set himself up to conquer. So Arabic to the boy means a whole world of exotic things, a whole world of erotic things, a whole world of utopian things. So that's the, essentially the utopia, the romantic utopia for the boy, which is now been caricatured by the adult world, uh, which just looks at, here's the word Arabic and then just caricatures it to a grotesque poem, uh, the Arab's fable to his steed, which is about, essentially about a very maudlin, sentimental, romantic, not a romantic, but a sweetly sentimental poem which is looked down upon as something which is very maudlin and very immature. So again, the trivializing of the romance over here is already at play and look at the way in which Joyce um, gives you markers of this trivialization. Uh, the whole point of how Araby, the grand bazaar, the utopian bazaar, the utopian space in a boy's imagination that is converted uh, into this very, very uh, cheap parody of a poem, The Arab's Fable to Esteem, is tantamount to, is reflective uh, all the different cognitive registers, the different linguistic registers at play, the adult register and the childlike register. When I left the kitchen and was about to, he was about to recite the opening lines of the piece to my aunt. So it is suggested over here uh, very, very subtly that uh, the uncle over here may be inebriated, uh, in a sense he may be drunk because he doesn't seem to have control over what he's saying, he doesn't seem to have any memory about what he had promised uh, earlier as well. So again, this complete detachment of the adult world uh, from the childlike world is part of the lovelessness that the boy experiences. There's no love at all. So first of all, he doesn't have any parent. He, he just talks about his uncle and his aunt, which suggests that maybe he doesn't really have his parents. And there's no love in, in the home that he's growing up in. Uh, so the lovelessness is underlined over and over again uh, through oblivion, through detachment, through indifference, etc. Okay, 
I held a florin tightly in my hand as I strode down Buckingham Street towards the station. The sight of the streets strong with bias and glare, glaring with gas recalled to me the purpose of my journey. So the sight of the streets strong with people, buyers and sellers, recalled, reinvigorated in him uh, the purpose of his journey. I took my seat in a third class carriage of a deserted train. After an intolerable delay, again, the delay is always intolerable because time is against him. So temporality becomes part of the romantic quest over here. Uh, the fact that, you know, anything that stands between him and the bazaar is now uh, an enemy to romance. So time, at this point of time, is intolerable, is an insufferable you know, enemy to romance. So after an intolerable delay, the train moved out of the station slowly. It crept onwards among the ruinous house and over the twinkling river. At Westland Road Station, a crowd of people pressed to the carriage doors, but the porters moved them back, saying it was a special train for the bazaar. I remained alone in the bare carriage. So again, the whole idea of the solitary quest is important because if you remember in the last lecture, we've seen how the transition from playing with the companions uh, to looking down upon the companions, someone a position of superiority and a position of height, literally a position of height, is something which is quite symbolic in quality. And likewise, the train journey over here is very, very symbolic. So the train over here is a commercial train, anyone with a ticket can get in. But in this particular case, it becomes an exclusive train for the for the bazaar. So the porters pushes the porters push everyone else back. So he remains the only person on the train. So that is to say that that underlines in its imagination is a knightly quality, uh, the quest-like quality uh, of this particular journey. Okay, it was a special train for the bazaar. I remained alone in the bare carriage. In a few minutes, the train drew up beside an impoverished wooden platform. So the word impoverished is interesting over here. Because, you know, uh, the whole idea of Araby being this exotic, abundant, excessive space is now about to be undercut uh, by the reality of Araby. So the expectation about Araby and the reality about Araby are completely at odds with each other in this particular session. The boy is about to find out shortly. I passed out to the, on, onto the road and saw by the lighted dial of a clock that it was 10 minutes to 10. In front of me was a large building which displayed the magical name. So again, the, the building displayed a magical name in front of him. Uh, but then, of course, the, the platform uh, that he got off it is an impoverished wooden platform. It's almost ad hoc in quality, right? Something which is just built uh, for that purpose. Uh, but once he gets off the platform, once he gets on the road, uh, and, you know, if he sees a big dial clock, it's 10 minutes to 10, and he sees a big building which displays the magical name, Araby. I could not find any sixpenny entrance, and fearing that the bazaar would be closed, I passed in quickly through a turnstile, handing a shilling to a wary looking man. So again, if you take a look at the wary looking man over here, uh, you should be reminded of the wary looking woman, uh, the knitting woman in uh, Marlowe's Heart of Darkness. Because even there, when he went to the Belgian office, there was this woman in, front of the, in the front part of the office who were knitting wool and who looked very stern and matronly and who almost had this Medusa stare at Marlowe. And over here too, this very looking man was very tired. And the tiredness of the man is interesting because, you know, that is completely at odds with his idea of Araby being this abundant, fertile, imaginative, romantic space, uh, which has actually been guarded by a very looking man. It's almost like a, you know, a gatekeeper of hell, a gatekeeper of somewhere, uh, some, a space which is essentially dead or deadening. I found myself uh, in a big hall girdled at half its height by, by a gallery. Nearly all the stalls were closed and a greater part of the hall was in darkness. So again, uh, instead of illumination and exoticism and you know, all kinds of magic, uh, what we actually find is that the entire hall is submerged in darkness. Right? So darkness over here becomes symbolic darkness, it becomes a darkness of disappointment. I recognize a silence like that which pervades the church after a service. So again, the timing is important, it's post-performance, post-service, post-event. So he'd obviously and evidently reach Araby post-event. So it's full of darkness, it's a silence of a church after a service. So it's a post-service church, right? So it doesn't really have any significance anymore. So, you know, it's a degree of, there's a degree of devaluation going on over here. The building, uh, the church metaphor is interesting because a building which had some value, which had some interesting, uh, you know, whole idea, the merchandise, being there, it had some value to it. But he reaches there at a point where all the words are bought and sold and there's no value left. It's been exhausted of its value. There's a, a degree of liquidation about the space. It's closed down, right? In the sense that you know, that's the church metaphor uh, very, very usefully used uh, over here. Uh, in the sense that, you know, it's a church after a service. It's not, not really a church anymore. It's just a bare building, 
right? So likewise, he reaches Arabi at a time when it's not really a market anymore. It's market like quality is gone, it's disappeared, right? So it's just a bare building uh, which used to be a market at some point in time. So it's closed down for the day, essentially closed down for the day. Uh, what in the center of the bazaar timidly? So the word timidly is important over here. He's timid in his walk, he's timid in his gait, he's timid in his movement. A few people had were gathered about the stalls which were still open before a curtain over which the words Cafe Chateau were written in colored lamps. Two men were counting money on a salver. I listened to the fall of the coins. So, again, this is a very interesting biblical metaphor. Uh, you know, this, the, the, the allusion to over here is obviously Jesus, the story in Jesus' uh, life where he goes to a Jewish synagogue and finds priests uh, counting money uh, instead of performing any holy duty and he gets disgusted with it. And it's the only, only time where Christ actually becomes angry uh, and he remonstrates the people for being so mercenary, right? So, there's this degree of disillusionment in this boy as well. And we've seen how the biblical markers and the erotic markers, they all put together in a very interesting combination in the story. Just so sexuality and spirituality, you know, they all come together in this one confused cognitive condition. So, uh, two men counting money on a salver becomes a very interesting marker of commercialization, a very interesting marker of insignificance, which obviously uh, irritates the boy. I listen to the fall of the coins. So the fall is an important way. The word fall, the fall of the coins is almost like a sound of shattered dreams or shattering dreams, right? So the whole idea of Araby, which used to be the space of abundance and fertility and imagination and romance is now coming to an end. And that end has been acoustically conveyed to him to the fall of the coin. So the fall of the coin is an acoustic reminder, an acoustic uh, representation of the fall of Araby. Remembering with difficulty why I had come, I went over to one of the stalls and examined porcelain and uh, porcelain vases and flower tea sets. So again, he remembers with difficulty why I had come. So the entire significance, the entire purpose that he had had to come to Araby is completely vanished now. So contrast that with the massive significance that he had pumped himself with in terms of coming to Araby and buying something worthwhile for his beloved manga and sister. But now that he is an Araby, the reality of Araby is completely at odds with the fantasy he had projected onto the space after having consumed knowledge about it. Right? So now he has to remember with difficulty why he had come. Right? So again, memory is failing him. At the door of the stall, a young lady was talking and laughing with two young gentlemen. So, you know, he sees one young lady with two young gentlemen presumably flirting with each other. I remarked their English accents and listened vaguely to their conversation. So, the English accent over here is very, very important because remember, the boy is Irish and this is taking place in Dublin. So, the uh, English accent over here becomes an accent of difference. So, that obviously, uh, they inform an identity which is different from the boy's Irish identity, right? So, the difference in identity is uh, demarcated or delineated with the user's accent. The accent over here becomes a marker of a different kind of identity, which is hostile, which is different from the boy's identity, which further alienates them from Araby. So, his experience of alienation is furthered by the difference in accents over here. And there is a very trivial conversation taking place, which is obviously a flirtation uh, between uh, the young lady and the two men flirting with them. Oh, I never said such a thing. Oh, but it did. Oh, but I didn't. Didn't you say that? Yes, I heard her. Oh, there's a fib. Now, uh, it's interesting how Joyce gives you a series of words which are actually doing a lot of things. So, the word fib is interesting. It's not really uh, the difference between fib and lie is the fact that fib is uh, less significant than a lie. A fib is a deflated lie. A fib is something, a fib, sorry, a fib is something which uh, doesn't really have any value, it doesn't really have any impact. It's so insignificant that it doesn't really matter, right? So, fib is an important word over here because it becomes a marker of insignificance, a marker of deflation of values, right? So, it's not really a lie in a sense that it's not, it doesn't really have any grandeur of a lie, it doesn't really have any uh, content rich quality of a lie. It doesn't really have any ontological density that a lie would normally have. There's no density. It's a fib is a shallow lie, a fib is a senseless lie, a fib is a casual lie. So, the casualness, the shallowness, they all connect to the insignificance, the insignificant quality that a fib would carry in normal situations. So, the insignificant, the marker of insignificance is used away here. It's conveyed to us by Joyce using the word fib, right? Okay. Observing me, the young lady came over and asked me if I wish, did I wish to buy anything. The tone of her voice was not encouraging. She seemed to have spoken to me out of a sense of duty. So again, this is the voice of the enemy. This is the voice of an anti-romance. So she just sees him and out of duty, out of politeness, 
uh, she just comes over uh, and asks him if he wishes to buy something. And obviously, there's an expensive place. He doesn't have the money and resources to buy anything at all. So he just uh, refused to engage with it. He just says no. But he also finds out, he also discerns a degree of detachment in the, in, in the lady's voice. There's no warmth, there's no connect, there's no desire to actually sell him anything. She just sim seemed to have spoken out of a sense of duty and politeness. I looked humbly at the great jars that stood like eastern guards at the either side of the dock entrance to the stall and murmured, no, thank you. So the two jars over here, they look like eastern guards. So again, he's trying to retain somehow uh, desperately the markers of this knightly narrative, right? So the two jars, which are very domestic things, that be equated in his mind, equated in his imagination, are two massive eastern guards guarding a kingdom, guarding an entrance to the stall. So the stall suddenly becomes a bit of a kingdom, an enemy kingdom, presumably, and the two jars are like eastern guards defending it, protecting it at the gate. So he's still using the vocabulary uh, of a knightly narrative, the vocabulary of a chivalrous romance. But then, of course, he knows that at the level of meaning, at the level of experience, this is actually very, very deflated. This is actually very, very insignificant. And the insignificance and the deflation, the deflated quality, are both conveyed with the use of the word fib. Okay. <clears throat> The young lady changed the position of one of the vassals and went back with the two young men. They began to talk of the same subject, so the same inane, meaningless conversation continued. Once or twice, the young lady glanced at me over her shoulder, so she's completely cut off. So the whole experience over here is an experience of alienation, is an experience of existential alienation, linguistic alienation, and also sexual alienation, because the Two men, they seem to be surrounding the lady and they seem to have all her erotic attention. And the, the boy over here who comes to buy something for his beloved uh, doesn't find any access to that space at all. And it's further cut off uh, by the English accent that the uh, lady and the two men have. So that English accent is obviously a further form of estrangement uh, for the Irish boy who can't get an access to that space. So that becomes an experience of alienation for him, quite literally as well as linguistically. And of course, experientially. So once or twice, a young lady glanced at me over her shoulder. I lingered before a stall, no, though I knew that my stay was useless, to make my interest in her words seem the more real. So again, he's trying to pretend that he's about to buy something. And of course, he knows that you know, his stay was useless because first of all, he doesn't want to buy anything, and secondly, he doesn't have the money to buy anything from that stall. So his whole idea of Araby has come to a very uh, painful end, a very painful fall. Araby is quickly falling in his imagination, in his estimation. So he had thought of the bazaar as some kind of exotic space where you just come and buy something for his beloved in a very knightly, chivalrous, romantic way. But now that he's here, he finds that he's surrounded by people who are either weary or tired, as in the person who let him in in the, in the translation, or flirtations and flippant, as in the two men uh, and the woman who are flirting with each other. Uh, and completely disregarding his presence, right? So the flippancy, the insignificance of Araby, uh, they all conveyed to him and conveyed to us uh, by default with the use of the word fib. Again, so I just, I can't emphasize this enough. So why is this a lie and not a lie and a fib? The reason why a lie is not written and a fib is written because, you know, Joyce is trying to convey or underline the insignificance of this entire episode, this entire experience, the entire speciality of Araby, which is obviously part of the massive uh, humiliation and excuse me, and disillusionment that the boy suffers and experiences. Okay, so he just lingers in there to pretend as if her interest, his interest in his wires is real. Then I turned away slowly and walked down the middle of the bazaar. I allowed the two pennies to fall against the sixpence in my pocket. So again, look at the close-up technique. So he, he, was, he was given two pennies by his uncle and he allowed the two pennies to fall against the sixpence in my pocket. Right, so that little symbol is very important and the fact that he fell, the two pennies fell. The two pennies were used were saved exclusively to buy something for Araby, uh, for the lady love, for Mangan's sister. And the fact that he, let it, he lets it fall uh, and merges with six pence in his pocket is a testimony to the fact that you know, it's a fall of a dream, it's a shattering of a dream. It's, an, it's a degree of uh, renunciation. He gives up the dream because he knows he can't dream it anymore. It's, an, it's been an entire disillusionment, an entire disappointment from what he had expected or what it turned out to be. So that release of the two pence is a very, very uh, interesting and symbolic release. Okay, so the two pennies, uh, the release of the two pennies is very in important and symbolic significance over here, which is something that you must pay attention to, especially for examination. Okay, I heard a voice called from one end of the gallery to the other that a light was out. The upper part of the house was now completely dark, so it's again becoming more and more dark. The lights are going out 
and the further lights are going out, it's making it more dark and dissolution uh, for the boy who can barely see anything, who can barely see anything of desire uh, in this particular space. So, he, he, he's walking out of the bazaar now like a defeated dreamer, right? So, a defeated dreamer like quality is something which is suggested by the deflation of language. And then the final sentence, gazing up into the darkness, I saw myself as a creature driven and derided by vanity and my eyes burned with anguish and anger. Right, so the, this is how the story ends. Uh, vanity is of course false pride uh, and of course the vanity over here is he had equated himself in his mind and his imagination with that of night uh, and the equation was he like night would go to Araby and find something romantic for his object of desire, for his object of love. Right, and of course, this equation with the night had been one which is very pompous and very narcissistic and very, very proud. And that equation is now, you know, decimated completely. And so the vanity is now, you know, something which is deriding him. Right, so it's driven as well as derided by vanity. It's mocked by his own vanity, and as a result of which, my eyes burn with anguish and anger. Right, so again, he's sad as well as angry at himself at everything that had caused the fall of the dream. Right, so you know this this bit is interesting because what it does it, it sort of symbolically indicates the end of the dream for the boy, which is also indicated when he lets go of the two pennies falling against a sixpence in his pocket. But now we it gets more and more graphic and more existential when he allows himself, uh, you know, when he had, he knows he had allowed himself to be vain. But now gazing up into the darkness, I saw myself. So again, this is a bit of a negative epiphany, and we've seen it already happen in. Uh, Marlowe's and, and, and Conrad's Hell of Darkness, where the only epiphany available to Marlowe is Kutz's words the horror, the horror. It's a negative epiphany. It's an epiphany from darkness. It's a light of darkness, right? Uh, and of course, we saw that again happen um, in uh, the previous text that we did, uh, in a series of poems in Eliot's early poetry, where especially preludes where the, the fallen woman figure is looking up at the ceiling and looking at a life flickering by, looking at different images in a, in a life, of a life, flickering against the ceiling like a montage, like a visual cinematic montage. So likewise over here, the only epiphany available to this dreamer is that of his fall, is that of his derided self, which is projected on the screen for him. So looking up, gazing up into the darkness, I saw myself as a creature driven and derided by vanity and my eyes burned with anguish and anger. So we've seen how his previous gazes were very, very erotic in quality. Yeah, he looked at Manga and sister, the different portions of her body, different portions of her dress in a very metonymic, almost voyeuristic visual uh, way. But now we are, he looks at himself, he finds himself surrounded or stretched across uh, you know, the, the home, the ceiling of the home and he sees his own self burning, his eyes are burning with anguish and anger. So, anger at himself, anguish, the desperation, the frustration of having fallen as a dreamer which is now coupled with anger at having dreamt in the first place. So, it becomes an, an example of irritation, an existential irritation or derision at himself which is a worse form of derision and this is where the story ends. So, essentially the story is about a fallen dream, the story is about fertility, is about romance, is about abundance and an otherwise uh, claustrophobic and very dreary Dublin, right? A Dublin which is dictated by the Catholic Church, a Dublin which is repressed sexually, morally, intellectually, culturally and in that particular Dublin we have this little oasis of Araby coming up suddenly and the boy desires to go to Araby and find something worth bringing back for the girl and the entire, the entire experience of disillusionment is something which the story ends with. Right, so it becomes an example of a death of a dream with which the story comes to its conclusion. So, I hope you enjoyed uh, reading the story. Do read it over and over again. It's one of the modern masterpieces uh, that, that Joyce had written. And we now move on to another story from Dubliners, which will start for the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.